take a moment and apologize for the poor quality of the audio on this intro. I am recording this on my phone. Just finished my 104th show here in Silver Dollar City and still have two weeks left, Uh, but we're having a blast. The rest of the audio on this recording is going to be great. It'll be stellar, and we've got an amazing interview today with uh, master illusionist Rick Thomas. I know that you're going to enjoy this one. We talk so much about his experience in the business uh, of show and all that it takes to produce a show at the magnitude that he's doing it. Uh, the family and I, you know, you'll hear in the conversation, we hadn't had seen the show yet when I recorded with Rick. I've seen him many, many times over the years, always been a fan of his stuff. He always puts more into the show than uh, the audience expects, always gives them more than uh, than advertised, and it's amazing. This show, I'm telling you, we saw it last night, it's brilliant. If you have a chance, if you're anywhere near Branson, come see The Mansion of Dreams. It's an amazing show. Uh, it really is a Broadway style production around magic. I mean, there's dancing and the the lighting and the sets are phenomenal. Uh, and of course, Rick is an amazing performer. This conversation uh, is really great too, because we get into some of the, you know, the personal side of things. The fact that, you know, for many years, as Rick will mention in here, he, he was he was hustling and grinding and, and pushing towards something. And, uh, you know, in the process of doing that, sometimes you can, you know, maybe not think about other people first. And there's some great thoughts in here uh, that Rick shares just about realizing that everybody's on their own journey and uh, and really caring for other people. So I, I, I think you're really going to love this. It's a great, great conversation and uh, with an amazing performer. So sit back, relax, and enjoy episode 121 of the About to Break podcast, my conversation with the amazing Rick Thomas. Hey friends, welcome to About to Break. I'm your host, Taylor Hughes, and I could not be more excited right now to be sitting down in his green room with the incredible Rick Thomas. Thank you so much for for having me. I appreciate you being here. Can you tell that the, we're talking early in the morning? Uh, yeah, we both. I, I've got. I've never <laughs> sound this suave. <laughs> that early morning, uh, you know, buttery voice going on. Well, and you, it's, I thank you for coming out here. It's good. Actually, I'm here early in the morning because I'm I'm, I'm at the theater fixing props. <laughs> <laughs> you, you caught me having to deal with uh, making sure something works before tonight's show opens. So, uh, well, there are so many amazing parts. I got to see your show last year. We were just talking, and and you've changed so much more since last year. But one of the things when pe- people when we're talking and Rick Thomas comes up, the first thing I say is. Every every time I think the first time I ever saw you was in a It's Magic show years ago, and mm-hmm. then caught your your show in Vegas. But every iteration of your performance I've ever seen, you do so much more. You put so much more effort and energy and illusions into that time. Most guys buy an illusion and they're like, how long can I stretch this yeah. out on stage? Yes, yeah. Well, I'll, <laughs> I, I do. I have a concept uh, with that. Um, I believe that if you make a, this is the best way to put it, if you make a girl float in the air two seconds or two minutes, she yeah. still f- flew in the air. Right. And there's no need for further proof. Yeah. And uh, it really challenges me when I watch uh, a magic show of any type yeah. where the magician attempts to show every f- form and feature in making something float in the air to prove it's floating. And in the process, they've proven that it doesn't float. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> they've, they've eliminated every option but the one. <laughs> yeah. There <laughs> I go. Okay, well, I'll figure that one out. Right. Uh, so, so you try to do something where it's just long enough where they can't quite figure it out, where there's a little bit of, you know, someone will say, well, I spent $2,000 on this illusion. I'm going to get $2,000 out of it. <laughs> right. well, my point is, is I just want the wow factor. Yeah. I, I want the moment where it's, it's there, it does its bit, and then move on. Yeah, I say this and I hope I hope uh, this comes along uh, as as humbly as possible Um, throughout my career. When I was younger, I am in my 20s, you know, was pushing very hard in the industry and trying to be the best I could and thought I was. And uh, life goes on and you you learn you learn from it. But um, one uh, illusionist came to me and said, 
um, Rick, your show's made up of closers. Huh. He said, yeah. every one of your illusions could close somebody else's show. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that, I mean, I never thought it that way, but yeah. I, I truly try to take every piece and make it epic, make yeah. that piece its own show. Well, that's how I just described it. On We were having this conversation on Facebook the other day about shows and brands, and we we're talking about your show. And I literally, I was talking with Chip Lowell and a bunch of guys, and I said, every illusion in his show is like the end of every... I, is that exactly what, what we just you're said. The one, you're not the one who said it, are you? Well, no, no, but I just... <laughs> But I, I just, but I just I, knew that there was a guy who came up to me after a show after yeah. I was absolutely wiped out. Yeah. I can't remember names and faces. He just said, man, your show's made up of a whole bunch of clothes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, that's what I tell everyone that. I mean, you you within and I don't I, again, I haven't seen this, season, but the last show I saw you do within like 15 minutes, you appeared a helicopter and then vanished it. And then, yeah, <laughs> and which which was to me. As a magician, there's a mo- was a moment, and I don't want to spoil the show. If you, but you open the curtains after he- you have made a, a helicopter appear, the curtains close. Yeah, when they reopen, it's still there. Yeah, and you're like, where, where, why don't you guys get? They're like, we don't have anywhere to put it. We don't have anywhere. To and put that the moment for me was like, yes, for the win. Thank you. Because Thank I, you. I've always, uh, you know, you see someone produce something massive. Yeah. And then all of a sudden the curtains close and two minutes later it's just gone. And th- we're just supposed to, as an audience, go, oh, well, I guess they just flew <laughs> guess that he, plane off the stage. That's right. He just kind of folded it up and put it away. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, this year, and funny that you brought that up because it's probably one of the funniest lines that it's I so personally funny. thought I'd come up with and it worked. Um, but this year that line is actually pulled from the show because really? I can't pull it off. <laughs> I, uh, I do still make the helicopter vanish Yeah, and it, I do it right after the appearance. So I do the appearance and then we turn around and make it vanish. Yeah. Uh, I remember talking to Jim Steinmeier and Jim, I was telling Jim, I'm going to make a helicopter appear and this is how I'm going to do it. And he's like, don't do it. Don't, <laughs> don't do it. Oh, Rick, please don't make another helicopter appear. Don't, don't do it. <laughs> so, but you haven't heard my whole story, man. Just let me, let me, let me finish the story. And I said, I'm going to then take somebody from the audience and put that person in the helicopter and make both that person and the helicopter disappear. He goes, now you're talking. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And he goes, okay, that's all right. Yeah. And uh, I pursued it from there. Yeah. And um, we had to rebuild and restructure uh, a, a helicopter that wasn't made to disappear. And <laughs> <laughs> that was a handful as well. Wow. Um, so so that, was a, that was a good thing to 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 work out. And I think that one of the things that I've always tried to do, it doesn't always happen, but I, I love magic where the audience doesn't expect what's going to happen next. I don't like telling the audience before I do it, what I'm about to do. Right. I don't get out there and try to say, okay, I'm going to make something huge, big and grand appear in front of you. Watch. Yeah. Uh, that's why the appearance of the helicopter in my show seems to be strong uh, because it's a, a beautiful miniature stage and yeah. I do the linking rings. And I do that because my mother told me I can't remove the rings from my show. Yeah. So in that being the case, and I wanting to remove the rings from my show, I decided to make it epic. Yeah. So I created this beautiful uh, stage that I present the linking rings on as though it was the first stage I ever performed on. Yeah. And then the entire stage opens up. And then all of a sudden, all the curtains drop and there's a helicopter sitting yeah, right there yeah. behind me. And I, I think that that's the point. Uh, the illusion is called, it's all about the rings. Hmm. Because it's not the helicopter appearance. Right. It is about the rings. But when the helicopter hits the people between their eyes, they're yeah. like, what? Yeah. Because I didn't. I didn't tell the audience that's what's about to happen. Right. Well, in that the miniature stage, as you as you perform on that smaller stage, it brings all the attention into this little moment, mm-hmm. you know. And you say it's all about the rings, but it really does make all the attention go right here. So it's almost like when the copter appears, like they just have no. <laughs> it's out of nowhere. The, yeah, you see yeah. people going, "What is happening right now?" Yeah. And it's and for those magicians who haven't seen it, it's super fast. It's really, really <laughs> fast. Super fast. Well, everything in your show is really, really fast. Like, I mean, again, you don't drag stuff out. I love that. There's almost there's moments in watching you perform that I go, "They want to stand up, Rick." 
They want to applaud. <laughs> and not- you don't, you, you know, at the end of the show, you'll get a standing ovation, but you said no to three or four of them to where at the point of the end, they're just erupting with, please, please let us applaud you. <laughs> you know, I was actually told that by one of our, uh, our ushers yeah. about uh, three or four weeks ago. He came up to me and said, Rick, you don't let the audience stand. <laughs> I said, are you kidding me? He goes, and you know what? And honestly, I don't even really notice it. I do try to keep the, the show moving. Yeah. Uh, I wait for that applause and I have this feeling that I'm, that's as much as I'm going to get out of the audience at that moment. And I move on. Yeah. And he said the, basically the same thing is if you waited just a little longer, that audience would be standing on their feet. I go, really? <laughs> so we tested it out one night and it actually worked. Oh, so that's awesome. uh, honestly, from you and from others, I am not one who can't learn mm. by others sharing their thoughts on the process. Um, you know, uh, there's a there's a line that I, I say to people uh, in after my show, people will come up and say, man, I've I've never seen you live before. Yeah, I've seen you on television, but I've never seen you live. And my answer back to them is, is I've never seen myself live either. <laughs> and no matter how hard we try, even though yeah. we watch ourselves on television, yeah. we will never get to see ourselves perform live. Huh. And I think that that's uh, that saddens me yeah. because I don't ever get to stand back and look at myself. Even on television, it just doesn't tell me everything I need to know on making the show right. Yeah. And that live feeling that you get, you right. just can't step oh, out, yeah. you know. So that's bizarre. I know I think weird things, but <laughs> no, it's no, it, it's, it's, it's important to think through those things. And I, I was telling my wife last week, I tried to describe, there's a moment when you're performing a routine that you've done a lot where, and it's not that you're not being present, but you can be three beats ahead or three routines ahead thinking about, okay, I can do a callback to this, or if I bring that person up for that, and you find yourself at least I find myself ahead in the show while I'm actually doing the show. It's almost like an out of body experience. Mm-hmm. Do you, you know what I mean? Like it's, and, and it's hard to explain that to someone who hasn't done something, the same thing over and over to be <laughs> or, able to... or in reverse, something went wrong. And it's the only <laughs> yeah. thing that you can oh, think you can about think three or four <laughs> effects. Like you can't get it out of your head and it messes with you the rest yeah. of the and show. People are like, he did it. Look at that. Look at this. And you're like, yeah, but, <laughs> but, but back there, but Bill over there stepped on my line. And <laughs> yeah, that's right. How many times do we, as, as magicians, when a magician, other magician sees your show, let's say there's an effect that went wrong. <laughs> that's the one thing they go, Oh, you know that your show was, uh, was good. And you're like, yeah, but, and you give this little him and or you've left a piece out that just wasn't working that night and said, oh, yeah, but you missed the you missed mm. this. Yeah. And, you know, I, it's one of those things that um, it's growing lesson. Uh, the audience has no idea what you're going to do. The audience right. has no idea what you didn't present. Yep. And you shouldn't apologize for what was missed. Yeah. It's hard not to, to tell other magicians, you know, you're putting your best foot forward. Oh, but man, if you come back tomorrow, you're going to really <laughs> see something. Yeah, right, Rick. Right. Whatever. Yeah. You know, just let it go and uh, and take the uh, appreciation and move on. I think, I think performers in general, that's a, that's usually a struggle is, is, is accepting praise or compliments and not always, because we want to, as artists, always be critiquing our performance, but... Uh-huh. You know, like you said, to be able to go, well, thank you. (laughs) Yeah, because there's always something that's wrong in the show, especially one that is of this size. And and Mansion of Dreams Yeah, with the sets and everything that we need to move around backstage to pull it off. There's there's a ton of stuff that can go wrong. And uh, in fact, last night something did. Audience (laughs) didn't notice. But again, that's why I'm here this morning. (laughs) Repairing a close to disaster moment oh no <laughs> but, oh but nobody i mean nobody literally knew right and i did i i will tell you um um sometimes i share someone will tell me wow that's that was an amazing show this or and i said you want to know something really amazing watch it from backstage yeah <laughs> they're like looking at me and i go you right. have no idea it's a right. cooler show backstage <laughs> yeah, than it is sure in it front is. of the audience i myself even i was like man we pulled that one off again <laughs> yeah see it's it's different when you're doing a you know you're doing a card technique and you might flash to one person on your right in in a group of 12 you're in a massive theater you don't want to flash a helicopter <laughs> no. you know what i mean like, no not at all also uh before every show and i think that this comes from uh 
the length of a career I've had in the industry. Uh, I stand before every show and look out over the stage before yeah. the curtain drops and look at everything that is there that is going to be presented. And I count my blessings that I have one more night to do a show mm. because you have no idea um, what's going on with your life. And when you're in twenties and thirties and you think that nothing's going to happen um, and usually it doesn't, you know, life continues on um, things, things do happen and you get to an age where you look behind you more so than in front of you and are grateful that you're able to do one more night and that those illusions, those effects that you've put your blood, sweat and tears into get to see an audience one more time. Yeah. You know, and, and to me that that's a, that's a very special experience for me. Just saying, wow, one more time. I get to do this one more time. Also, uh, you're only as good as your last show. <laughs> we've, we've heard that before. So you got to make sure that if you made a mistake the night before you get a chance to fix it. That's huge. I, I want to talk about that because last year I was, I was in town for a week and I got to see your show and it was amazing. And I, I mean, I took away, this is the biggest illusion show I think I've ever seen. Like there is more magic happening in your show than any other show I've seen. Thank you. Thank and, you. And then, and then we talked this morning, you're like, well, this year it's, you've <laughs> yeah. added so much more. Talk to me about that because most guys would go, well, I've done it. I figured out. <laughs> yes. All right. Let me, let me put it back to, for years while I was in Vegas, I wanted to do a show called Mansion of Dreams. Okay. Always have for years. I planned it. I designed it while I was on cruise ships. I even started writing about it. And, uh, there was a plan to present the show in Las Vegas and put it into a hotel that was never finished. Okay. So Mansion of Dreams was going to be presented in Las Vegas. And about the same time, I was asked to come out to the Andy Williams Performing Arts Center in Branson, Missouri, <laughs> and present my show. And I said, only if I get the chance to present Mansion of Dreams. Yeah. Now, the funding and everything for the show in Las Vegas was not coming from me. We have a, there's a saying, and, I, and if there are illusionists out, illusionists out there who disagree with me, I disagree with you. <laughs> the, 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 the verbiage is we are prop poor. Mm. Um, we illusionists put everything that we have into our show and into our props. And at the end we turn around and go, what do I have? Right. <laughs> a whole bunch of props on stage is extremely expensive sport. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, um, uh, so I got out here to Branson knowing that I had to continue to present my show as it was in Vegas and do it, everything I could to try to build out Mansion of Dreams. Yeah. Well, five years later in our sixth season, I was able to open up Mansion of Dreams. It took 10 semi trucks to bring the sets in from New York to wow. Branson. We did it stealth. Nobody knew what was going on. <laughs> truck after truck after truck came pulling in. And when they were pulling them in and we were starting to unload the trucks, every truck I opened, even though I knew <laughs> what was happening, I'm like, oh my goodness, how am I going to pull this one off? Yeah. Our stage manager said, Rick, what are you thinking? <laughs> and I, I've always known, I have always known that it's theater. Anything is possible in theater. Right. You can pull off things that people can't even imagine. If you have to build a platform yeah. and take that platform and hoist it up with four chain motors above the stage to take half your show and put it above your heads while you're doing the first half, then do it. Wow. Then lower that platform. Put your illusions on the platform that you just finished. Yeah. Take the other ones off and reset for the second this, half that's, of the show. This is what you did in Vegas, right? Yes, it was. Yeah. <laughs> we built amazing. We built a platform on the side of the stage that held the second half of the show. Wow. Huge, massive platform. <laughs> we hoisted it in the air, built, put it above our heads on the side wing. All the first half of the show was able to sit there, finish it, 15 minutes. They bring it down, push pieces all around, get them off, put the other ones on, take it and get it out of there and do the second half of the show. Now, of course, you could rebuild out the theater, but we were performing it like the Tropicana. Right. That was a massive stage with massive wings. Totally. So even then, uh, the show kept running out of space. So here we bringing these sets for Mansion of Dreams. And the sets themselves are so huge and so epic that um, the magic likes secondary. We're yeah. like, well, we're going to stick this. Well, uh, we're just going to take that out of the show. Well, right. you can't take that out. We do. Um, I do a motorcycle vanish as, as many do. And uh, uh, we want the, we wanted so much to keep it in the show in some way or form, but it couldn't fit the stage. I didn't ever have a problem with that until this year. I had a sweet woman, probably in her 
sixties or seventies walk up to me and go, I miss you doing the motorcycles. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you know, amazing. when you just finished doing this yeah, completely yeah, yeah, yeah. different show, right. you're like, uh, they're in the garage. <laughs> 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 so it's it's hard. So we we spent months putting it together because it's all about the mansion of dreams. It's all about taking an audience as my invited guests through yeah. my mansion from room to room. Sure. And and that's where the audience follows it. The audience enjoys watching what's going to happen next. It's not totally about the magic, it's totally about the experience. Yeah. It's about following your dreams and making your dreams a reality. And I tell the audience the mansion is where my dreams became a reality. So I share with the audience my my life, my mansion. So my my mansion is really representative of my life. Okay. And then in the middle of the production, the mansion burns to the ground. Oh my goodness. Um, we, I talk about uh, uh, spirits from our past. Yeah. How um, all of us have a past that we can't let go and it crawls inside of us and changes who we are. Mm. And when that happens, the tragedy begins. And for those who know different names of effects, and I tell the audience that your past crawls into you, I present osmosis oh, wow. and my past yeah, 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 crawls yeah. into my body. And then when that happens, the tragedy begins and that person then reappears at the top of the staircase and causes the staircase to burst into flames and the mansion burned to the ground. Wow. So the second half of the show, I walk out to the audience and I say, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you've realized this or not, but the mansion's been destroyed. Yeah. And then there's like silence, there's crickets and I go, obviously you do not care, but I'm going <laughs> to let you know I do. <laughs> so, but I do it in a way that it's supposed to be funny. So right, it right. works. Yeah, and yeah, I say, yeah. But you know what? Don't worry. I said, I'm going to try and put the mansion of dreams back together again. And I know the question you have in your mind anyway, are the dogs okay? Yeah. Now, I have great Pyrenees dogs in the show. So they appear right at the beginning of the show. And so because the mansion is destroyed, I pretend that the audience thinks that the only thing they care about is the safety of the dogs. <laughs> so we bring the dogs back out and start the second half of the show and i present the second half as though i'm on tour sure. so i tell the audience i've toured the world i've been very blessed in my career uh while i put the mansion back together again i tour the world so then we are allowed to then do the helicopter yeah and other effects that within the walls of the mansion were difficult to pull off right and and as I get to the second half of the second half of the show, the mansion starts coming back onto the stage piece wow. by piece. So at the end of the show, by the time it finishes and the bows are taken, the final back wall of the mansion is re-revealed to the audience and we stand there with a the mansion restored. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's incredible. So it, it's kind of like um, your dreams. Yeah. All of our dreams, all of us. Life is hard for everyone. Right. Life is tough. And I... There's a line I also say in my show, uh, be a little kinder to everyone because you have no idea what they're going through. Right. Yeah. And I wanted to, I wanted to make the mansion of dreams appear that as though it was uh, representative of our personal dreams, where when your dreams are destroyed, you have to turn around and try and rebuild those dreams. Yeah. Now, those dreams may not be exactly what they were when you first had those dreams, but there's something like it and at least you've progressed and moved forward and you need to follow those dreams so the mansion of dreams is, is like restoring your own personal life and getting your life back in order again and it's all back in order maybe in a different format in a different way but it's rick uh, that's it's incredible yeah. that's incredible i mean where did that where did that piece of it the the kind of the inspirational side of it come from was this i mean obviously you had the idea for doing this show with the sets and, you know, in the, in this mansion that shifts from room to room, but where did that, what inspired that piece of, I want people to consider their own life in the midst of this. It's not told to the audience. I tell them continually through the show, follow your dreams, make your dreams a reality. Yeah. This is where my dreams happen, but I let them figure it out. Uh, I just tell them, look, the mansion's been destroyed and now I need to put it back together again. Yeah. And, and I'm, I don't want to blatantly tell the audience, just like your own dreams. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Let them, let them figure out part of it. However, I will tell you, it doesn't matter. There's still people that walk away from the show and, and they'll comment about the show and say nothing about the set or the <laughs> mansion or anything like that. And, 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 uh, they'll say, uh, 
something about like the lady. Well, where are the motorcycle? <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute! You just <laughs> would you, you see look? the staircase that burst into flames? <laughs> <laughs> the grand ballroom staircase that just imploded. <laughs> yeah. And you have no idea. I remember when we brought the um, fire marshal <laughs> over to show the the the, the set, and and we turned on the stairs, and he's like, he goes, he looks at, he's like, whoa, that's way above my pay grade. <laughs> he goes, like, you guys know what you're doing, and I go, yes, I brought the greatest pyrotechnic. Uh, professionals in the industry and to put this together yeah. and, uh, you know, gave him all the credentials and then showed him our system. And yeah. it is, that's why I tell the, tell you that the greatest thing in a magic show is backstage because yeah. the effect itself is stunning. Yeah. What we do to pull it off and how it looks to the audience is good, but backstage is, it's pretty crazy. Killer. <laughs> oh, that is awesome. And then, uh, and then the curtain closes and I, I, I crushed, I, I collapsed to the ground and yeah. the curtain closes and the fires are put out and everybody sits there for a moment and takes a breath. <sighs> I, uh, I, I was worried at first on closing the first half of the show that it wasn't magical yeah. because setting a, f uh, f stairs on fire, so to speak, isn't magical, but it's theatrical. Right. It is, it is stunning. I, I've always felt that magic is the perfect art form. Hmm. I don't, I believe that, that people are truly talented when they can sing, they can dance, they can act, but a true magician needs to be able to do all of that. Right. Yeah. Everything is encompassed within a magic production, the sets, the costumes, the, some guys don't have to sing, but <laughs> dancing around, uh, the theatrics, the acting, right. All of, all of that, the greatest of what it is to be a performer is what's within the world of magic hmm. and the mansion of dreams is that it's me taking it to an epic, um, uh, Broadway style production and create a mansion that is so beautiful and goes beyond the magic yeah. that it becomes a show. That's not about the magic, right? Magic's part of it. I want it to be a magical show. Yeah. Yep. Not a magic show. That's so good. Yeah. That's so good, man. I can't wait to see it. We're, we're coming. I'm bringing the family. Oh, you think so? Yeah. Oh, I want <laughs> we're, to. We're not letting you in. <laughs> oh, no. We want to go. So I, I got to see the show last year. And when we were making plans to come, so we're here for six weeks this summer. Wonderful. And while we're, we were making our plans, I'm like, okay, when we go, we're all going to see Rick's show. Um, and now they're going to be even more stoked to see it because my daughter, my 13 year old, is obsessed with production and Broadway and musicals and how things go together with sets. And so she's never seen a magic show that has its own set, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you know, most, most magicians troop. And so it's all backdrops if they have anything and uh -huh. to be able to, to build in stuff is amazing. Well, I, uh, uh, my my inspiration uh, watching Siegfried and Roy in Las Vegas oh, yeah. uh, and the opportunity to do so and see their elaborate production um, and the sets and the style and the scenery and everything that went with it was just I think that maybe the young generation doesn't know sometimes some of the magic that's already been presented in the mm -hmm. world. And I know that we got some really cool card tricks and close up stuff going on on the Internet. Yeah. Um, but the David Copperfields, oh, yeah. the the people that created unbelievable effects yeah. and the work that went into it is yeah. far removed from some of what I see today. Yeah. I wonder sometimes where is the creativity? Where do I see it happening? Hmm. Uh, it's, I think it's, it's, it's a style that was uh, one generation mm -hmm. and then we have another generation with a different style right. and then maybe the next generation will have grand illusions again. Yeah. But I, but I see it changing. I see a lot of people doing close up. I see them doing close up with cameras on big screens and right. theaters. And I just, it was, it was in my heart. It was true to me, Rick, you need to still do a, a big production. You need to do something where there's actually costumes, right? Where the, all of our costumes were made in Germany. We, I really studied hard and fast to make sure I designed everything like nothing else. Wow. The, just beautiful, beautiful pieces. And, and I just felt that it needed to be something grand rather than something minimal. Yeah. I just feel that sometimes some of these shows are going minimal on us. And, uh, 
uh, at least for myself, before I left this wonderful world of ours, yeah. I wanted to do that show where I was proud of it. And Mansion of Dreams is is that. Now, I'm going to tell you right off the bat here. Yeah. My whole concept about dreams is, is once you have a dream, it, it creates more dreams. Yeah. And once you've completed that dream, you can't stop from dreaming even further. Right. So now that Mansion of Dreams has been completed, <laughs> it's not complete. That's what I was, that was my next question. <laughs> our that plans, was my next question. Our plans for the future with Mansion of Dreams is, uh, I'm already working on new illusions, new effects, wow. new design, and uh, hopefully making it even bigger and better than what it is. I hope you're enjoying this episode of the About to Break podcast. Three quick ways that you can help us out here at About to Break. The first one is to go on iTunes and leave us a review. Uh, if you enjoy the program, please leave us a five-star review. Big thank you to everyone who's already done that. If you haven't yet, please jump over to iTunes. You'll need your iTunes account information. Uh, but you can click on the podcast, leave us a five-star review. Just leave us a one or two sentence little blurb there. Let people know what you like about it. That helps us out huge. Second way you can help us at about to break is by becoming a producer. Uh, our goal is to have a thousand people given at least a buck a month to help offset the cost of producing these shows. And it does take time and uh, it is a passion project. I will continue putting these out for free because I think it's a helpful conversation. Uh, but anything you can do to help us out by producing the show would be awesome. Go over to abouttobreakpodcast.com, click on become a producer and see what that's all about. Last thing that you can do, and this one is also a real, a real simple way of making a difference, is just sharing the podcast. All right, when you see it out there on social media, on Instagram, Facebook, uh, go ahead and follow along and then share it with your friends. Let someone else know how much you liked it because it sure does make a difference. All right, back to the program. It's it's such a contrary attitude. I mean, you, you talk about things going in waves and this happens with everything, with clothing styles, you know, bell bottoms come back in, you know, every 30 years or whatever. <laughs> but... Uh, but it's so contrary as well, your attitude of how can we give the audience more? Most performers, and I find myself from time to time in this mindset of uh, traveling and going, how can I pack small and, and play and, big? <laughs> yeah. And often, unfortunately, especially when you look at the things that are marketed to magicians to help them play big, it's just, it, it's, it happens in their mind. The audience is not getting a big show, yeah, you know? No. And I, the idea that an audience doesn't want to see props or doesn't want to see sets or costumes is ludicrous. I mean, look at Broadway. <laughs> yeah. Yes, <laughs> you know? Yes, yes. So it's, it's, you have a definitely a different approach to most guys when it comes to how can I continue to give the audience, you know, under promise and over deliver. There are, um, there is actually two sides to that. One, I, um, I, I appreciate putting the big f effects in and sometimes those effects are the, are the thing that may draw the audience in, but they aren't always the thing that the audience remembers. Right. That's what you have to point out more often than not the big grand effect is far less impressive right? and far less wild than everybody thinks it is, but it's, it's the draw. Yep. Um, I have, uh, I've, I learned it. I learned it when I watched a, um, a show, e it was in Vegas as well. Um, it was called EFX. Oh, was I saw that with Michael Crawford. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Amazing. Let me tell you, it was amazing. And people again, forget the sets, Yeah. how huge it was, the yeah. amount of money put into this production, the greatest segment to me in the entire show after yeah. they've seen Lights, flashes, videos, production. The curtain opens up and there's a table sitting in the center. And there's a spotlight on the table and there's like 10 people surrounding this little table. And the stage is completely empty. Yeah. There's nothing there. And they're doing a seance. Yeah. And all of a sudden, all the people fly away from the table. And oh, the yeah. table flies up and goes away yep. and leaves the stage empty. That was... Yeah stunning and it's the thing that you remember because it's there was nothing there right so so the big has to be there the mansion has to be there the the fire the pyro the it's there but there is a point in my show that i do um a piece called uh, liquid glass mm -hmm. and uh 
it's on a huge stage with a huge set and yeah. it's a little piece at, like I do in one. Right, like right. Yep. Small little piece. And more often than not, I will, I will have people come out of the show and say, my favorite part of the show was that what you did with that glass. Yeah. Because it was, it was a moment. It's like you're screaming and yelling, look at this set, but look at, yeah. look, and that only thing they can focus on is that little thing in the center of the stage. Right. And it's so quiet. Yep. It's so quietly deafening yeah that the audience just can't they just you hear the audience they're silent they're just like, right Whoa. yeah and that's that's the moment that when they walk out and now uh the funniest part though you do ask people after the show what's your favorite part of the show right children it's the dogs <laughs> so, <laughs> or the streamers that shoot at the end of the show yeah they, they love the streamers i said then i'll just do two hours of streamers yeah <laughs> <laughs> and then uh i'll get a lot about the helicopter but most more important than anything now this year is just how epic the set is yeah and um how i tied my life around this mansion of dreams yeah it's it's a, that's amazing i cannot wait to see it i'm stoked mm. i want i want to ask a, about you've worked in las vegas You've worked all around the world, but you've done residency in Las Vegas and you were in Guam for a while, yeah, right? Residency. Five, five years in Guam. And then and then now you're resident in, in Branson during part of the year. What is what is the biggest difference in those I mean, those are vastly different audiences, environments, weather. <laughs> <laughs> um uh, how how do I the biggest difference, I brought what I thought was a family show from Las Vegas to Branson. Yeah. Because it is a family show. Right. My show was the cleanest show yeah. that you could have in Las Vegas. <laughs> totally, yeah. But but the the first thing I learned was don't tell people in Branson you're bringing a show from Las Vegas. Because yeah. mentally they think, <laughs> that's, they think that's, it's a Vegas show. <laughs> we are definitely in an area we call the Bible Belt. Yep. And I'm, an, I'm religious, so... My mother, if I can't do a show for my mother right. and our standards, then I can't do it for anybody. But yeah. it doesn't matter. No matter how hard I tried, no matter how much clothing I put on our dancers, <laughs> you, you still get right. individuals saying, oh, I can't believe what I've just seen. Right. And my interest is I, I have to play to everyone the best I can. Right. But what I find interesting is just a little secret. It doesn't matter where you are in the United States. We all have the same problems. Right. We all have the same secrets. Yeah. And those people who tell you that their life is all, <laughs> all good and, right. and it's all, you know, they it's just, all religious. There yeah. are skeletons in everybody's closet. Oh, yeah. And Branson is that kind of place where we say, wow, it's all about the family. It's all about this and that, but there's an undertow. There's, yeah. there's something yeah. out there. And, uh, but I am glad, I am very glad that I can raise the family here. I'm, yeah. I'm very happy that I can present the show in the style that it is. Yeah. There are a couple lines I've actually truly just removed from the show. Yeah. They may, they're not suggestive. I've, I've designed a show my whole life about saying something that's way over the heads of children. Right. And I say it to a, the adult audience and it's not even blatant. It's not a joke. It's not a line where I say something and it's just blatantly what I mean. Right. I try to say things where it it sounds like something but means something else. Yes. Where the yeah, audience yeah, yeah. has to figure out the joke. Yeah, the joke happens in their mind. Yeah. Um, one of my famous bits in my show is where I bring the little boy on stage and I tell him to look into the girl's eyes and I grab his head <laughs> and I pull his head up and yeah. I said her eyes. Yeah. Now... <laughs> <laughs> That's now, these are things that took a long time to create. So guys, right. don't steal my stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but but you have the, you have this this bit where you know that it's charming, yeah. that it's cute, that you're admitting yeah. that that relationships and physical relations with people between men and women and any other relations you have, they're there. Yeah, and you admit to it, but you don't make it. You don't make it dirty. You don't make it slutty. You don't, but you do it in such a nice, cute way that the kids don't understand it, but the adults. Oh yeah, that was pretty funny. Right. <laughs> yep. So those are little bits and pieces that are, are, uh, are, are good. A lot of times when people come out and say, "I didn't think the show was going to be as funny as it was," right? And I go, "I'm not funny. We have fun. I don't like. I don't work on jokes. I don't. I don't say jokes in my show. Mm. Um, it's a lot all, of it is situational. It's all situation. Yeah. Com situation yeah, 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 comedy. Yeah. yeah. Well, but and you have the ability to, because I'm sure some of these bits that you do that are situational based, 
some of them probably happened on the fly at one moment. And then uh-huh. it went, okay, now how do we recreate that moment? Yep. Most every one and, of them. And, and you're and, able to do it in a way where it seems natural. It doesn't seem like, oh, he's doing the line. Which And what's special about that is when you do situational-based humor, but you're able to create the situation, people walk away going, oh, you should have been at the show we were at. This little kid came up. <laughs> And he told them to look in the girl's eyes. You know what I mean? Like, right? right. It, I feel like it makes it even more special because people go, "Oh, this is this is just for us." Yeah. There's also special moments that you you just can't let go. About a week ago, uh, something happened after the show, and I can't let it go. And I tell uh, every, I tell every audience, yeah. the story because yeah. I can't let it go, and it's going to somehow just stay in the show because <laughs> it's that funny. We. We magicians are very lucky breed. We get to do things that other people can't, mm. or at least it appears that way. Right. We can cause ourselves to fly in the air. We can change something into something else. We do things beyond human thought. Yeah. And it's really, sometimes it can, it can catch you and bite you in the butt because you think you're better than other people yeah. mentally. Yeah. Um, but um, on the other hand, it's extremely uh, humbling. Yeah. As well, if you, if you take it and realize that you have that opportunity to share something so amazing with the rest of the world. So a family was leaving after the show and uh, a dad ran back in after the show and he had a 10 year old son and he left his family outside. He ran back in, grabbed me and says, I just have to tell you when, t- when you made Tara fly up into the air, my son looked into my eyes and he said, dad. He has the force with him. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Isn't that the coolest? I mean, that's that's what it's about. That's, that's that, so that, fun. He has the force. He has the force. And that kid believed it. Yeah. I mean, he's like, oh, wow. Oh, that's the best. That's <laughs> yeah, the, the best. best. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I was thinking about a little guy that came up the other day. And uh, <laughs> I love these little moments where like, this, this kid goes, uh, I, I, people were saying magic wasn't real, but now I believe it's real. <laughs> <laughs> it is real. It is real. I believe it's real. Yeah. I think that the the show works because I believe it's happening. Uh, yeah. Everything I do when I'm doing it, I'm as shocked as the audience. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> it's yeah. amazing. And the, and the look in your eyes has to show that you yeah. are absolutely in love with the art of magic. And what do you do on those nights? Because there's and maybe they're once a year, maybe they're once every six months where you're just not feeling it. There's got to be, you know, every performer gets to those moments where... <laughs> Where you go, I don't feel like being magical right now, <laughs> okay. but there's an audience waiting. <laughs> no. Do you have any sort of yes. routine or ritual or can I tell you supplement that? <laughs> what do you do? All right. I, I'm going to say this humbly again, and you guys can count my shows I've done, but it's every night. Yeah. It's not every six months. <laughs> it's not every year. Right. It's every single night. I have been very lucky. I've performed over 22,000 shows in my career. Wow. Uh, starting with um, um, shows at Disneyland Hotel, three shows a night um, for two years, and then off to cruise ships and then fairs in the industry and theaters. And I counted it up and it makes me feel ill. <laughs> so, so now, uh, with a career of 40 years before every show now creating mansion of dreams, Lance Burton said it best to me Yeah. when I was sitting there backstage at his theater, the Monte Carlo. Yeah. And he looked at me, <laughs> he looked at me right in the eyes and he says, Rick, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> And you know what? It, it 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 went to my core. So here I create Mansion of Dreams. And before every show, these words, be careful what you wish for. And um, I sit there. My cast know to leave me alone in my room. I'm, I'm there. I sit in my chair and I have my head down about 30 minutes before show and go, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh my goodness. I have to pull off this show again. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and then... Uh, I get on stage and about, about 15 minutes into the show, the first portion of the show, the, where, where the mansion moves, the, the, the dancing, the, everything that goes on on the yeah. first 15 minutes, just says, bam, 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 bam. And I, I then walk off stage and I change my shirt and um, there's a transition occurring and I take a breath and go, okay, I can get through this one. Yeah. And that's how I get through the next show. And yeah. by the time, but by the time the show finishes, 
because I wonder every night why I'm doing what I do. <laughs> and then a- after it finishes, I walk out there and I greet the audience and they all leave. And, um, I stand there in the uh, front area of the theater yeah. and there's silence. And I think about what has just happened in the past two hours. And I go, this is why I do what I do. Yeah. I know that all those people walk out and they are, uh, we aren't, we aren't that important in their life. Um, I hope that magicians realize that if they think the world is centered around them, it's not, <laughs> it's everybody has troubles and everybody has problems. And once they see your show, you're a couple hours of entertaining them and then they move on with their life. Right. Uh, and I just think that you, when you realize that and you put yourself in a spot where where we're very lucky to be people who make people happy, yeah, but not get so caught up with ourselves. I saw it when, sadly, Siegfried and Roy's show closed in Las Vegas. Mm. Um, uh, Roy, of course, was hurt. And within a week or so, billboards were removed. Uh, a new show was put in place. And is it was almost as if they had never existed. They were, an, I mean, an entity. They in made yeah. Vegas. Yeah. They were part of what Vegas was and even is today. Yeah. And I realized at that point that we are, that, how do I, else do I put it? Okay. Uh, I, I, a lady came up to me at, at, right before the show started. She was asking me all about the show. What am I going to see? All this and all that. And she's about 40, 45 years old. I said, I can't tell you that. Just enjoy the show. Yeah. Just enjoy the mansion. And she looks up and she goes, can I ask you something? I go, yeah. She goes, who's Andy Williams? <sighs> Now, you have to remember, we're in the Andy Williams right. Theater. We're in the Andy Williams Performing Arts Center. Yeah. His pictures and every superstar of his yeah. day yeah, yeah, yeah. are splattered all over the walls. Right. And she said, who's Andy Williams? Yeah. Now, she was at an age where she should know who he was. Right. I also brought on a, a young magician uh, and brought him in as like an intern at one point. He was about 20 years old. And I, and he, he said, how do you want me to act? I said, like Jerry Lewis. And he said, who's Jerry Lewis? No. So no. that I hope that I hope tells magicians get a grip Yeah. because, <laughs> right. Because life moves on and you're only there for a moment. So when I stand there on that stage and I walk out and I look at everything that's out there and I say, how lucky I am to perform one more show. Yeah. I mean it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, and it's super cool. It is just, it is amazing to go to those props and pat them. Okay, one more night. Yeah. You, do, you, you lucky little props get to right. see one more audience, you know. And uh, and I, I feel that way. And I think yeah. that that's where it's come to it. For all those people who thought Rick Thomas was um, ruthless and mean and challenging in my younger years, uh, I feel that there's a, a big difference. Maybe Mansion of Dreams did it as well. Huh. Because I am not so thrilled about what I present, I'm thrilled about what I know the audience is about to see. Yeah. Does it understand? Do you understand yeah. making that oh, yeah. a little different? Totally. It's not about, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I'm going to wow them with this. And I'm going to wow them with that. I go before that curtain drops. Wow. I know what this audience is about to see. It's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, cause I think it is, yeah. I think it's beautiful. I think it's, it's amazing. It's the most amazing thing I've ever put out there. And I, I gave it everything I've got. My life savings went into it. Remember I told you I was prop poor. Yeah. 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 I'm set poor. <laughs> <laughs> everything I have went into this and, uh, I am just very proud to know that when people walk through those doors, that I'm confident that they're going to walk out enjoying the evening and that they're going to experience something just really beyond what they expected. The silence when the curtain drops and they yeah. see that ballroom for the first moment, yeah. people are like, you can see it. I, I know I don't come out till later in the, in the show. Yeah. So the, uh, I, I stand on the side making sure everything's working, all the electronics. Yeah. <laughs> and at the same time, I, I peek my head around the side and I just, people's mouths. That's what's great about magic. We all know everybody's mouth opens at the same time. You know. Yeah. I was, I was oh, yeah. like, oh. there's no applause. It's just yeah. open mouths. It's the show you get to see. <laughs> <It's true. laughs> Rick, that's beautiful. It's such a healthy perspective. Um, I think all too often we can get. And I think it's where a lot of the anxiety and the pressure in this business comes from because we feel like what we're doing is so critical and so essential. And, you know, it's like people who do actors who have been on Saturday Night Live, you know, comedic actors that go on Saturday Night Live. Everyone who ever talks about it, 
they talk about it now like it was the greatest thing, but they all say, I didn't enjoy one ounce of it because I was so stressed and worried and feeling like I was going to lose my job or, you know? And I think we do that as performers all the time. Like we get so in our head that we're not ever in the moment. And like you said, sitting there and appreciating and thanking and being grateful for that show that you're doing right then. Yeah. It's about, and I tell my cast and crew as well. Uh, there was a point uh, performing in Vegas as long as I had um, uh, that my crew crew often because they don't get to see the audience. They don't have a relationship with them. Right. And they start letting their guard down. They yeah. don't quite do what they should be doing on the stage. And you have to tell them that every single person on that stage is critical and important. Nobody's more important than anybody else. We're all a team. And they have to realize that there's an audience who paid a lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. of time, effort, and money to be at this show. And it's your responsibility as much as mine to make sure it happens. Right. I'm the lucky one. I'm the one who gets to have that relationship with the audience and I never forget. Yeah. But you have to remind everybody who's involved. Don't ever forget that there are people who deeply appreciate what you're doing back here. I know you're not seen. I know you're not appreciated as though you think you should yeah. be, <laughs> but everybody's important. So I, I give them that pep talk and tell them, don't ever forget. Um, be there for the moment, be there for that show, yeah. give them all you've got, uh, and, um, and appreciate the success of the show. That's amazing. But, uh, it's, it's hard to put into words until you've lived it. Yeah. Um, they say that, uh, uh, every time anybody goes and talks to a wise man or a wise woman or a wise person, they're old. <laughs> <It's true. laughs> they're portrayed as somebody old and why right. is that yeah. because you can't learn it's experience except through experience yeah and you look back on it and realize wow i thought i was good i yeah. thought i was something i thought i still was something and and now i'm just grateful that i have that chance to be in people's lives i say a line in the show which means more probably to me than the audience realizes yeah i have a new effect called chairvoyance that took two years to put into this show. I'm very proud of it. And I turn to the audience and I say, everybody is important. Everybody has a life. Everybody has a story to tell every single person in this world. All of us in this room are only here together at this one moment in time and we'll never ever together be here again. Yeah. This is it for this group of people. Yeah. So when you take it and you take that moment and realize that all those people sitting in that audience and you together, that's it. That's, this is our moment together and yeah. life moves on to me. It may be a little bit more deep than it needs to be, but I, I think seriously, wow, that's, wow. That's just a special moment that all of us yeah, have yeah. together oh, yeah. that we're never going to experience again. Absolutely. So for that reason and that purpose, I take every show seriously. Also, my grandmother taught me well, my sister and I, I don't know if Mark Kalin remembers this. Um, but I do, <laughs> uh, I, uh, it, I have tremendous respect and love for these people in the industry, um, uh, Mark and Ginger Kalin and, um, the, just the amazing people they are in the style oh, yeah. that they have. But I grew up ballroom dancing and my grandparents taught it. My parents taught it. And to this day, they still teach ballroom dancing. And my sister and I competed in ballroom dance. Yeah. And when I started to perform my magic at first, I was very, best way I can put it is Blackstone. Hmm. I'd stand there and I'd point at an illusion and then something right. would happen and yep. I'd point at something else. And my feet, my feet wouldn't stop. I mean, they just started dancing around on the stage. <laughs> and uh, I remember very young, Mark had come up to him and goes, what are you doing? <laughs> I said, I don't know. I'm just dancing around. I can't help it. <laughs> 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 Dancing around on the stage was a little goofy for a magician, but I found my place. I found my style yeah, and I found the way I present my production and it stuck with me. Yeah. Um, so that's, I'm comfortable in my own skin and I, I found myself. I looked at the magicians from the past, those before me and every magician I think does. If you say you don't, or you're not inspired by right. somebody in some right. way or form, my inspiration didn't come actually from magicians themselves. It was other entertainers. Yeah. I would look at superstars. Yeah. And I'd say, what makes them so much uh, more amazing or intriguing than other people? And it wasn't always their talent. Hmm. There was just something about them. Right. They're, they're everything about them. So as far as my world, 
my dancing was involved. Uh, theatrics, the magic and the illusions themselves, the costumes are important. I try to take everything that's me. Yeah. Everything that's musical. I played the trombone also for about 16 years growing up. Yeah. So music is in my head. That's what I am. And you have to find yourself. You have to find out who you are and play to that. Yep. I also remember a magician coming up to me once. He was a very funny guy. Uh, goofy guy is the best way I could put it. He was, he was just, he just played differently than I did as an illusionist. Right. And he says, I want to do illusions. Yeah. I want to be an illusionist. I go, no, you don't. <laughs> I said, unless, unless you can pull that off, which people like Ed Alonzo have, that right. have that kind yep. of style. Yep. That's awesome. But it, it wasn't, he, you get him out there on stage and he's like a fish out of water. Yeah. He said, why don't you do what comes naturally to you? Find yourself. Yeah. And once you do that, then you have the greats and magic. You have the Ed Alonzo's. You have those that have found how they can be that style and rock the world. Right. And, and, but you need to take a look at what everything, what, what's out there. And then at some given point, jump off the diving board and become yourself. Yeah. Find out who you are and follow your life, follow your, your direction. Now I'm going to say this and I'm going to get slapped around pretty hard. <laughs> But I have a hard time with impersonators. Yeah. <laughs> There's quite a few. Yes. And that's why I'm saying <laughs> right, it quietly. Yeah, we'll say it quiet. My reason is, is um, I know that we appreciate stars and we appreciate learning from them and who they are. Right. But to be somebody who you aren't your whole life and to live somebody else's life. Yeah, it's got to be. Awful. And it's not your own. Yeah. To me is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so impersonation, because all your w what you're doing is you're taking somebody else's successful life, right, and living off of that with their music, their songs, their dancing, whatever it is. Yeah. Now I'm not saying they're not talented, unbelievable people. I'm just saying that I had to find myself. I didn't want to be a David Copperfield. Right. I didn't want to be a Mark Kalin or yeah. the Ed Alonzo. We each of us has have our own thing. Yeah. And I think that that's what's going to help any magician is by finding themselves as quickly as they can. Yeah. I I talk about how magicians have personality disorder when you know they do the rope <laughs> trick they're Michael Finney and when they do the card trick they're, you know, Michael Amar and when they you know like they emulate so much whoever they saw do a similar routine that they never give the audience any of themselves. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's tough. I, that reminds me of the old oh, fresh fish sold here today. Yeah. 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 And you learned the patter. Yeah. And we all did it. Yeah. And we all did fresh fish sold here today. And we ripped the paper and we say the same line, the same patter. Yep. That, that is our deepest problem in the world of magic is, is, is selling an effect. And with that effect, selling the routine. Mm. Yeah. I don't know, that's, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, take your illusion, tear it apart, put it back all back together again, yeah. <laughs> make, make it your, and I think that's what I've hoped to, to, I hope that when people watch my show, they may see illusions and effects that yes, have been around in the world of magic for ages, but, um, my own take on it, my totally. presentation and style, uh, and the way I see it is I hope far removed from many other magic shows. Rick, that's awesome. And it's encouraging. I know that people are listening to this right now and taking notes and going, okay, what do I got to do to fix this or that or pull it out? <laughs> be I, careful what you wish. Be careful what you wish. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got I to gotta ask you as we kind of come to the end here. I, I love asking people about horror stories because, you know, if a guy, if a guy does close-up magic and mm. he loads his pockets with a deck of cards and rubber bands and he goes out and performs, at some point something's going to go wrong. Right. Yeah. But if you're doing a show as massive as you do, I'm sure that exponentially, like there's so many more things, props that could break, assistants that could miss their cue. I, I walked around Magic Live uh, a year before last and just asked, you know, Johnny Thompson and Amazing Jonathan, like, tell me your horror stories. Johnny <laughs> told me about when he forgot to load all his birds yes. and he walked out. <laughs> yes, that is a <laughs> like nightmare. A me too. Johnny, <laughs> wherever you are, man, yeah. I'm telling you, I'm with you, with you on that one. Do you have, is there, you know, is there one, it doesn't have to be the funniest one, but is there one moment that stands out or oh, if something's gone Absolutely. Wrong? Last night. <laughs> You're like, that's why I'm <laughs> there is one i'll share one but i'll tell you about last night as well okay yes the helicopter vanish is um a, a unique piece that that took me a fair bit of time to put together 
it is the best way I can put it a ballet backstage. Yeah. The people needed to pull off the vanish of this. It's not simply taking a helicopter right. and getting it out of the way. No, there's way more going on that, that <laughs> even magicians, there's no clue. Right. W- the stupidity that I had in putting this together. <laughs> uh, but, but there are people, there are six, seven people that need to be wow. there on that stage to pull off the effect and everything has to happen. Bam, 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 bam. Well, if one thing goes wrong, it yeah. all collapses. We have the final out or the final when the, when the front door opens to show the helicopter gone, it's gone. But, uh, the ballet last night was more of a football, football <laughs> game. <laughs> I come running around the side and I'm watching everything vanish in its own way. And I'm like, Oh, slow motion. Yeah. Ah, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm here to fix a couple things. <laughs> uh, one, um, <coughs> You know, I tell you backstage, not to forget there's an audience out front. Uh, one night when I was working with the Tigers, I was doing a Lion's Bride. And um, my Lion's Bride consists of three uh, girls in the effect and a tiger yeah. and a crew helping them set and prep the prop before the curtain opens. And uh, I'm going at lightning speed and the curtain opens and I see in front of me. Uh, a stage tech standing with his back to the audience, holding up a special area of the illusion to prep the girls <laughs> and two girls climbing up the side stairs to climb into this effect and everything freezes and it looks like deers in headlights because they've all been caught. And you got to remember the girls now are in skull caps. <laughs> we have <laughs> wear wigs. wigs. They got costumes. Right. They're in tights. They're, they're, it is not a pretty moment. My girls are gorgeous, but at that moment, yeah, they're, that moment, they're not, not, not so hot. So. And, and, and you see my tech, he, he stops and he turns around and slowly turns to the audience and he looks at the audience and he puts his head down and he, walk, he walks off the stage. One of the girls walks off the steps and she runs off the stage and the other girl runs around behind the illusion trying to hide <laughs> behind it. Now there's nowhere to hide. It's a big effect on top of these legs. You can see her legs dancing around and she finally <laughs> runs off. Now there is a tiger in this piece ready to appear. Right. And the only way that I can even make a tiger appear on the stage is to actually have somebody in the illusion. Release right. The they, tiger. Yeah. They've got it. So I'm standing there on an empty stage with an empty cage and everybody running in every direction. <laughs> and, my, and my lead girl comes running over to me and I say, she says, what do I do? And I said, get in the cage. Yeah. Now in my previous show from years past, I would make a, uh, I would, I would make a, a tiger appear, fly a bird through the audience, put the bird in another cage and make that bird turn into a girl and yeah. then walk the tiger. Well, she thought I was telling her to get into the second cage. <laughs> so she runs off the stage and she crawls into a second cage, <laughs> leaving me completely empty on the stage. So I turn to the audience and all I do is. Yeah, and the curtains close and I walk the stage. <laughs> but it, it all happened within 30 seconds, and it was truly, honestly, the yeah. most embarrassing because it literally looked like nobody knew anything. No one knew what was going on. Yeah. And everybody was in a very unorthodox scenario, <laughs> uh, it, it, and it was just a massive exposure to the audience. Um, the tiger uh, actually did not appear, as you can imagine. And the funniest part about it was I walked back and there is, <laughs> there is grace in the second cage going, okay, now what do I do? <laughs> now what do I do? <laughs> and I thought to myself on my head at that moment, how funny it would be if we had done the whole show and grace, after all the lights have been turned down, everybody's gone. She's still in that same cage going, hello, anybody here? <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> and I went over to her and I knocked it. You can get out of the cage now. <laughs> <laughs> so I said wrong cage. Yeah. Uh, so, so that was a moment and there's worse ones. I mean, there's, there's times when I've dropped things on stage and been embarrassed or our birds don't appear when they should, or they only half appear. Oh. Um, so, you know, it's, it goes on and on and, and there are books that all of us can write. And I think that the, that's one thing that magicians probably truly enjoy more than anything else is all of them sitting around a round table and everybody telling everybody their, their horror stories. Right. Because remember, we all have a life. No one's perfect. And something always goes wrong. 
That's <laughs> awesome. It always goes wrong. And I think that also even more so when you involve other people. Yeah. It gets to a point where um, there's too many people involved and you rely on too many people for you. Mm. And you have to be careful of that as well. As a magician, you stand in front of the audience and you claim that you are something great and amazing. And when everything is done by somebody else and you just stand there, take the applause. Mm. I live my art. I, I have worked so hard to understand the art of magic and, and work so hard to master when I was doing close up magic, it's my passion close. I love close up magic, yeah. learning passes, learning the lists, m- learning counts, all those things that are critical to understanding what card magic is all about. Yeah. If, if we're closing this out, I'm going to leave this with a thought because this is something also to remember. Uh, we have just lost Don Wayne. Yeah. And, uh, he was, uh, inspirational in my career. And I leave a thought about Don, and this will help all of you who think you have to do something amazing to wow the audience. I turned to Don one day and I said, Don, I want to make one of my illusions magically glide off the stage at the end of the effect. I want to just take my hands and just throw them out in the air and the the illusion and just leave the stage. Mm -hmm. And I said... What kind of mechanism, what can I do to create this? What what do I have to build? What kind of tracks do I need to put this on? And Don looks at me and he says, a rope. (laughs) And I go, what? He goes, less is more. He said, tie a rope to the bottom of it and have somebody pull it off the stage. He said, one, it will never fail. And two, it's the same effect. Don't complicate things. Yeah. To Don, thank you. Yeah. Use a rope. (laughs) (laughs) And again, it's those little things you need somebody from the outside to pull you back down to the ground. Yeah. Stop it. Stop it. What are you trying to do? Yeah. What's your final effect? Yeah. If you have to do 10 passes in a card trick to pull off a card trick, (laughs) I can guarantee you the effect is not worth (laughs) doing 10 passes passes you're doing to do it. Right. So I say, look at what you're doing. Look at the effect. Look at how hard you have to work on it and say to yourself, is it worth my efforts? Same thing about how long you do something. Right. Don't blow it by dragging it out when you don't have to. Yeah. Hit the audience between the eyes and move on. Find out what is great about each piece you do. Yeah. And master it. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Rick. Thank you for taking the time. This has been incredible. I mean, I I, I was going to take notes, but I got it recorded, so I don't have to. Oh, I'm going to <laughs> go back and listen to this over and over. I so. thank everybody again for listening. Please know that, uh, again, in my later years, I've chilled out. <laughs> 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 I am... Uh, I use the word blessed because I am. I'm super blessed to be in the world of magic. I love this art form. I truly love the art. I love entertainment. When I go into a theater and I watch any live show, it does not have to be magic, anything. i probably the first person to cry. I sit there in the audience and go, wow, this is the coolest thing on earth. Yeah. How lucky we are to be part of this industry, to be live entertainment. And, um, and change people's lives in some way or form and make a little bit of their life happier. Uh, I, I appreciate it. I'm grateful for it. And I'm grateful that I get to do one more show. 